I invite you now to join me in this refreshing moment, this moment of cleansing and renewal, this moment of intimacy for you to be one with yourself. If you feel so inclined, go ahead and take a nice deep cleansing breath in, breathing in the cool, calming oxygen that surrounds you. And as you release the breath, release all that no longer serves you. Allow any doubts or stress or tension in your body to just wash away right now. And if you feel so inclined, go ahead and take another nice deep cleansing breath in, breathing in the love and light that is God itself. And as you release this breath, allow your body to just relax in this moment. And allow your mind to be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin this inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself up to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your hand and let my words act as your own for your own inner healing, acceptance, and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of this infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I choose. 
I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. Visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, in seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words, I accept. knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This could be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room with me this morning or on this planet anymore. I turn to that image in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in this room or virtually on this broadcast, and share in confidence and gratitude in saying, I'm grateful for the good in your lives. Shout out also to uh, I got a really sweet email this week from a student in our past Essential Earnest Homes course. Reverend Katie and I have taught now seven online iterations of the Essential Homes course to, I want to say, almost 175 students uh, spread over those classes. And I got an email from one of those students saying that out of their cohort, they were like in the third or fourth of the seven. Um, five licensed this week as practitioners. Um, that's huge. And so I want to give a shout out now to all the practitioners, whether I know them or not, or whether they've passed through our educational program here, but all the newly licensed practitioners and centers for spiritual living, because it's licensing season. And it's also ministerial licensing season, as we know, because we, we gave a shout out to uh, newly, newly graduated Dana Vogt, almost, almost reverend. There's a few more hurdles you have to pass to get there. And uh, so these people are joining us now in service to you in, uh, in this field of consciousness that we have. Also, I love the pool toys behind me here. This is great. They say this was here last year. I don't remember. It wasn't quite... It wasn't quite as much as all this. Yeah, we had fun. You had fun. I, you know, something about just says fun. Something about this just, I cannot picture you doing this seriously. Yeah. Um, and a happy Pride weekend as we conclude Pride Month. But as with any celebration of this type, it's never confined to a day or a month. It's never over. We stand in solidarity with our LGBTQIA+. Uh, fellow godlings and for equal rights for all and there's a wonderful song that you're going to hear coming up in a little bit that speaks to that too um, and I'm proud of this organization because we've always this has always been our stand uh, it isn't just a sudden awakening that came to people and it's uh, well truth is truth As I was saying to a group the other night online how many lives are there one life one life one love one power, one presence includes all of us. Now, in explaining that life, we use metaphors. We use metaphors, we use illusions, we use symbols to try to explain the unexplainable, the inexplicable. Life is like a this. God is like such and such. Uh, human relationships are. Uh, probably the greatest spiritual teacher that we know of, certainly the greatest I ever 
I know of taught in parables. He taught in parables. He could have come right out and said stuff, but he taught in parables, and I think that was so that people had to work things out for themselves. They had to, they had to think hard. They had to think hard to, uh, to keep up with it. And then it, they, having done that, they internalized the lessons much more effectively than he, if he had just said. Now, he did come right out and say a few things like, oh, I don't know, love one another. <laughs> Can't get much more direct than that, right? Love one another. But much of the time, he was saying the kingdom of heaven is like this or that or the other thing. Try to relate the ideas. So I love metaphors and, and uh, I find them necessary to get across a lot of the more abstract principles of a teaching such as this one. And a metaphorical structure that I've been using this month is water all kinds of water. So to circle back to where we were on the first, this has been a long month. There are five Sundays in June this month, which is odd for a 30-day month, and it's been a long summer already. It's been summer for 10 days, and already we're saying, are you kidding me? But to circle back to where we were on the first Sunday of the month, I said, in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And that's the very beginning of the book of Genesis, the first creation story. God moved upon the face of the waters. Wait, what? Where did the waters come from? In the beginning, there was absolutely nothing except waters. Uh, why not trees? Why not clouds? Why not mountains? No, waters. What do the waters represent? This is not a historical version of creation. Historically, as far as we can tell, scientifically, things rolled out in a different sort of way. The waters mean not, in this context, physical H2O. They mean consciousness. They mean consciousness. Now, I understand that Friday night there was quite a spirited discussion about consciousness in the Friday night discussion group, which has spirited discussions every Friday night, hence the name. Uh, I, wanna, I wasn't there, but I want to put in my two cents here about consciousness. What is consciousness? Well, first of all, it is what it sounds like it is. It's being conscious. It's awareness. It's the potential for awareness. You and I are conscious even when we're oblivious. Does that make sense? Because the potential for consciousness exists. We're conscious even when we're ignorant. And ignorance is not the same thing as obliviousness. See, obliviousness means you just don't know something. It's never crossed your field of vision. Ignorance technically means you're ignoring it. So you are aware of it, but you're like, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm not looking. I'm not reacting. That's willful ignorance, but it's still a form of consciousness. And then there's the form of consciousness that we most usually think of it as being, which is full-on engagement. I'm aware, I'm alert, I'm awake because I'm alive. And so I'm paying attention to things. But consciousness has all of these states present within it, and all of the gradients of possibility between these different states present within it. So you can be anywhere on the scale, anywhere on the continuum of consciousness and still be in consciousness. Now the consciousness factor that we're again mostly conversant with is intellectual consciousness, cognitive processing type consciousness. You give me an idea, I think about it, I react. You're speaking to me. I stand there listening. Or as one comedian has put it, I stand there not listening but waiting to speak. And you're like, you're like in those commercials where the, uh, somebody's talking to their dog and, and what the dog hears is blah, 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 its name, blah, blah, blah. Uh, blah, 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 food, blah, 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 walk, blah, 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 vet. <laughs> <laughs> trip to vet's office and so on. So a, a lot of times we screen out a lot of things and still it's consciousness. But that's 
the cognitive processing kind of consciousness that most of us are familiar with, and it's what we're taught in our schools. It's what we're taught to pay attention. And they put the plan on the board, and they'll tell you that this plus this equals that, and they'll tell you here's how you conjugate a verb. And I was sitting there thinking about water as a metaphor before my talk and before I got to come up and drum, and I was, I was thinking about aqua vitae, the, the water of Latin for the water of life. And then I remembered Mr. Samuel. Mr. Samuel was my fifth or sixth grade Latin teacher, and he would have said aqua viti. And so which of these two is correct? And then I sat there thinking, I really shouldn't be wasting my time thinking about this because <laughs> I've got a talk to give and no one really cares. But I thought, you see how it works? We go back into this information, much of it, with all due respect to the Latin language, trivial, which is also a Latin term. But we, 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 you know, we have a head full of junk a lot because we were kind of taught this. And I, I know the capitals of all the states. Why? I can, and a lot of countries. And I can look this stuff up. I don't need to know this, but it's how we're, how we're educated. And this is no knock on our schools or anything else. It, it's bigger than that. It goes back centuries, and it's a, largely a Western Hemispheric kind of thing. But you and I, and we've talked about this many times before, you and I have been heavily overeducated in some peripheral material. And when they have asked us how we feel about it, we really don't know. And we really don't know where to look. And that, my friends, is tragic. That is tragic. Because out of the heart are the issues of life, not out of the head. Not from between the ears. But out of the heart are the issues of life. How do you feel about your life? You know what often we've been told? It really doesn't matter how you feel. Get up, go to work, make some money, come home and spend it. And that's, that's basically it. And do that till you drop dead. And and how you feel about that is, is, well, if you're a poet or something, maybe, right? If you're a painter, a musician, then, yeah, okay, you can traffic in feelings a little bit, and maybe get some place with it. But for the most part, it's like just put all that stuff away. I'm saying, and I stand with Ernest Holmes and a lot of other people and saying, bring it back out because this is really what matters. So this then brings us to the subconscious aspect of mind, which is still consciousness. Think of an ocean. On the surface you have waves. You have tides. You have the activity of motion on the water through wind, the craft that sail, and so on. Go deeper. Go deeper into the ocean, to the stillness of it. And it's not the waters are not moved upon because you're no longer dealing with the face of the waters. You're dealing with the body of the waters. This is the deep subconscious. And it's at that level that life is created. It's at that level that we're all connected to one another. It's not certainly at the level of the surface and it's not at the level of the intellectual games that we play that we're all connected to one another because it's very hard to get us together to agree on anything. Right? And as soon as you get a bunch of people to agree, then somebody changes their mind, and now you've got to deal with that. And, and there's just sort of endless, and then we have to remind each other of this and you know, pick up where the conversation left off. But at, the, at the, the basis of consciousness is where real union exists, where real communion exists, and we're all, we're all one. So we're diving into the deep end, you might say, in terms of dealing with water as consciousness. Consciousness has so many different aspects, and one of these is represented in the transformation of water into other substances. This occurs in the Hebrew Testament as changing water into blood out of the Nile. I think it was Moses that did that. And it occurs in the Christian Testaments, particularly in the Gospel, well, exclusively in the Gospel of John, in the story of the wedding at Cana. You know what happens there? Well, let's look at that story because it's, a, it's a, a why and a how. A lot of times, see, we want to jump to the how. Ooh, that sounds good. How do I do that? Water into wine. 
Even if I don't like wine, I could make some money at it. It's like the alchemists changing lead into gold. It's a metaphor. Still these people tried because there was an obvious profit motive. Gold is worth a whole lot more. So people want to know, how do I do this? Because even if I don't like wine or you know, I don't personally drink or something like, or there's not a wedding happening, uh, I, could, I could make a profit at it and I could impress my friends. I could impress, I could be like, watch this, watch this. Well, if we're ever going to know how to do something, we have to know why we're doing it. And this applies to any form of manifestation whatsoever. Do you want to improve the quality of your life? Why? What's in it for you? What is it you want instead of what you have now? And what are the motives back of that? When you understand that, you open the door to positive change. Otherwise, we're just dealing with principles with no, with no emotional investment. And therefore, the principles aren't moved because we're just batting them around kind of conceptually. So there is a story in the Gospel of John about a wedding that took place. And Jesus was there, and the disciples were there, and his mother was there. And at a certain point in the festivities, they ran out of wine for the guests. And Jesus' mother instructs him to get more wine. And he replies to her kind of um, curtly, and he calls her woman. Don't call your mother woman. <laughs> you won't like what happens next. <laughs> well, scholars have debated and are debating to this day, whose wedding was it? Uh, one popular version now has it as Jesus himself was getting married, probably to Mary Magdalene. It really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What matters was that this was the first uh, acknowledged miracle that he ever performed. Before he healed anyone, uh, before he did the big dramatic things uh, like stilling the storm on the Sea of Galilee, he converted water into wine. Did they actually see this happen? No. Barrels that had been full of water are now full of wine, so it happened kind of behind a screen, you know, behind, out of sight, in a way. There's a school of thought that completely deflates the whole story, which is they found some wine. They found some barrels of wine among the barrels of water, and they said, oh, it's a miracle, when in fact they just had miscounted. The, the order, they'd gotten the order wrong at the wine company or something, or, you know, it's just, uh, just like if in terms of feeding the multitude, Jesus manifests loaves and fishes. It deflates the story to think that rather than summoning this stuff out of thin air, the local townspeople got together and said, we need to feed these folks. They're on our land. You know, they're, they're here for something. Well, in either case, it's still a miracle. So you can look all this stuff up, and you can, you can see all of the different, some, there's some of the really strange theories. There's some really strange theories about this whole business, too, along with all the other miracles that Jesus performed. But why I bring it up and why it's useful is that if water is a metaphor for consciousness, wine can be a metaphor for intoxicating consciousness for celebratory consciousness. In fact, that's one place the Catholics take this story. Is they say, well, because he was okay with wine at the wedding, therefore alcohol should not be forbidden. And they were saying this in recent times to Protestant groups that were teetotalers, you know. So they kick it around culturally that way. But think of wine in a useful kind of way, and why is it still used today in the communion? Well, because at the Last Supper he took the cup of wine, and wine in many cultures has accompanied a meal, a good meal, it still happens to this day. But metaphorically what it represents is the kind of thinking that you go through and the kind of thought plus feeling that you go through that's elevating, it's transporting. It carries you away from ordinary reality. It creates in you an altered mental state. Now, I realize for those of us in recovery from 
too much alcohol in the wrong ways at different times. This can be a problematic issue. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Nobody is suggesting you run out and you get the idea. It's a metaphor. I don't need wine in my life. I don't want wine in my life. But metaphorically, I'll take all I can get. Because I want to sit there and read stuff and think about it and feel something. I want to sit there and do spiritual mind treatment work and think about it and feel something. I want to have conversations with people and think about that and feel something and have it carry me away. What do I want to have it carry me away from? Ordinary reality. I don't have time anymore for ordinary reality. Ordinary reality is pay bills till you die. Ordinary reality is just, you know, it, it's like shuffling off to the mines. Like in, uh, what was that movie, uh, Joe versus the Volcano or something? You remember that one? All of the people and they're going to work and they have their lunch bucket and their hard hat and they're just trudging into this thing, you know. None of us has time for that anymore. We need a transporting type of consciousness. So we do this every time we look at the ordinary and we call for something more. We call for something more. We transform this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Also, be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Works both directions. Paul said that. To look at ordinary reality and find the extraordinary aspect in it takes a little work, takes practice. It goes back to the series we had on uh, Emerson earlier in the year where we're looking at nature. Look at nature in a whole different way. We hole up in air-conditioned buildings and stuff. We're not aware of the phases of the moon, the turning of the wheel of the year. And then we wonder why our hearts hurt a little because everything is just so, well, ordinary, you know? You got to go outside and you got to look and you got to take it in. So we look at reality and we say, I'm going to call forth a miracle here. I'm going to smite this rock and have a spring of water issue forth from it. I'm going to do what Moses did. I'm going to do what Jesus did. This wasn't stage magic. This was deep magic, deep, powerful work that these individuals performed. And it's available to us today. And I'm going to start right where I am, right where I am, at the next seemingly ordinary experience. I'm going to call for something more. And you know what happens when you do that? Something responds. Something responds. The spirit moves upon the face of the waters. And some very strange and wonderful things happen. To call for magic in your life invites it to make its presence felt. Just be aware that you can't entirely control it. Just be aware that when you're working with stuff at the feeling level that you can't completely manage it. It sort of overwhelms you. And that needs to be okay. But if you go back and look at the stories of the people who engaged in this kind of thinking and prepared themselves emotionally for this, they all had their worlds rocked. I mentioned Paul a moment ago. Look at him. Look at what happened to him. I say, well, he took it in a direction and it was about, you know, conversion and it was about this and that. Well, first of all, it was about an awakening. What he did with it was his business how he chose to teach it. It's up to him. But he was blinded by the light for a while. That's what happens. That's what happens. And in this course, we're winding down now on Monday nights. I think we're going to get to that this tomorrow night. A story that some of you know really well about our founder, Ernest Holmes. And he had an ordinary experience. You know, a wedding is a beautiful thing for the two people involved and for everybody else, it's a social engagement. Okay, the mothers and stuff, right? But you know what I'm saying. You go, how many weddings you've been to in your life? How many weddings you've been in a wedding party in your life? Besides bad bridesmaid dresses and stuff, it's just, you know what, it's just what you do. And then there are baptisms and bar mitzvahs and there's, you know, there's all kinds of things. and. Sadly, a funeral here and there. 
that you get to be a part of. It's an ordinary occasion until you choose to see it as being extraordinary. Well, Ernest Holmes, the founder of this teaching, had experiences like that that were the opening of new churches. We used to call them churches of religious science. Now they're centers for spiritual living, but it's Mox Nicks. Uh, and he would go to these events. They would invite him to these events. Or they'd dedicate a new building. Or they'd install a new minister. Or they'd have an anniversary or something. And so the guy was, he was on the, uh, the rubber chicken circuit quite a bit at, at, at these events when he was still with us. And his career was pretty far along. And he's at one of these at a church in Whittier, California. Not long after his beloved wife of 30 years, Hazel Holmes, had passed on, and he's giving a talk, and he's saying, it's great to be here, and it's good to see you, Joe and Susie, and he's giving a shout out to the people that he knows there, and how wonderful it is that you've got this beautiful church, and, and blah, 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 like that, when all of a sudden he stops and he says, I see it now. We do mingle with the hosts of heaven. The veil is thin between indeed and I shall say no more and he sits down and they freaked out the people there freaked out and they thought oh my god he's having a stroke why because that's ordinary reality that's what ordinary reality would say he's ill there's something wrong with him he left the script he went, right? He deviated from the norm here. So there's something wrong with him. No, there was something really right with him. Everything he'd been talking about, everything he stood for, everything he advocated suddenly came walking down the aisle in the room where he was. And we don't know exactly what it was, and it doesn't matter because it was his trip and not ours, right? But the fact of the matter was it was a life-changing moment for him. And I keep bringing it up. And it, it lived. There's even an audio recording of this thing, which we'll listen to in class tomorrow night. But I keep bringing it up because that's what happens. That was his Paul or his Saul on the road to Damascus kind of event. Did it change his teaching? I don't know exactly. It's hard to pin, pin it down. But it changed something in him. It moved something in him. So when we think about the ancestors, when we think about all the people who've touched our lives, when we think about all the beauty and wonder and magic in the world, you got to realize one moment it's going to come walking into the room with you. And you're going to have to adjust and that which was conceptual and yet longed for becomes actual and real. So what I invite you to do going forward is Imagine that you have this power to convert energies, to convert one property into another. Imagine that you have this power. Guess what happens with what you imagine? The power manifests itself. You have the power to take an ordinary afternoon and spin it into something wild and creative, powerful, incredible, life-changing and memorable, never to be forgotten. You have the power to do that. Why wait? Why not start right now? You're surrounded by godlings. You live on a beautiful planet. We want to take better care of this planet. We especially want to take better care of the living beings on this planet, the fellow godlings. How do we do that? Taking good care of ourselves, knowing that we're all one. So let's know right now that oneness. Let's speak a word and then see it come walking into the room. There is one life, one power, one presence. This life is all there is, and it has many names. We think of it as God or the divine nature, the ultimate ground of all being, that which is. This life has always been, it shall always be. And while it's always being, it's doing, these, doing this in a series of moments. The eternal now. One of those moments is right here, right now. Take a moment in the middle of this knowing to just be cognizant of where you are. And it's Sunday morning, almost afternoon. We'll be in just a few ticks of the clock in this time zone. You're sitting in a chair in a building 
on some land, facing a street, part of a city, near an ocean called a gulf. You're wearing a body. Your feet are on the floor. Your hands are in your lap. You're wondering what I'm going to say next. And you're thinking about lunch. And all of this is just as it should be. Now listen. Listen very carefully. Not to me, but to you. To what comes up. What comes up like the mortar between the bricks. What comes up like the space between the thoughts. Like the space between atoms. Like the space between stars. Listen to that silence. Listen to that wonder. And it will remind you of who you are and have always been. Your spiritual estate, your spiritual home. That you carry with you everywhere you go. It will remind you of the power that you have to transform experiences in life into beauty, into kindness, into greatness. May you never forget, but always remember this one life that is spirit is all the life you have, all the life you need, and all the life you will ever, ever meet. For this knowing then, the way that it resonates in form, all the travels in its wake, and all the ports of call it guides us into, I am so deeply grateful. I release this word now, calling it done, and so it is. We appreciate all you do for us. We appreciate your giving. And we hope that you continue to support us so that we can get this message of hope out to the world, this message of goodness, this message of love. So take your gift in your hand, either physically or in your mind, and say with me, divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all the good I am and have, all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now. And so it is. Yeah. So I'm looking around at all the pool toys, and I'm also reminded that it's hurricane season. Uh, we've already had a, some, some weather, uh, and so I think it would be a good idea to just go ahead and kick off our hurricane season with just a reminder <laughs> to, as, as we watch uh, this season come and go, and it doesn't matter what they say about it. You know, they can say, oh, it's really active. Oh, it's not. It's going to be what it is, right? But what we can do during hurricane season is that we can hold each other in the safety of spirit. Uh, there is apparently some weather headed towards Barbados, and we have a couple of people in Barbados. So we want to know that all of the people of Barbados, not just our two, but all of the people of Barbados are safe and all the other islands that are in that path, um, you know, if, if, if we could just get a remote control and have the hurricane stay out off the land, that'd be great. We haven't figured that out yet. So what we do know is that we can treat and we can treat that they know that they are the beloved expressions of the divine and that they are held in the peace and safety of the divine. And, you know, occasionally we all want to stand there and go, can this cup pass, my, pass by my lips? So, you know, there it is. All right. So I am encouraging, especially since it's, we're finishing up water metaphors and we're talking about hurricanes. Uh, yeah. I, I've been through enough. I have been through, I, I've been through enough hurricanes. Um, that I don't need any more experience to, to, cause I, I've gotten the spiritual lesson. Yeah. So, but life is what it is. And 
we will deal with it as it comes. But the good news is that we'll deal with it together as a community. So, all right, so consciously with me, since we started out talking about consciousness, uh, I invite you to consciously step into the sacred with me. It is sacred all the time. It is all sacred all the time. But we experience it as sacred when we make the conscious effort to do so. Step forward with me into the sacred knowing that there is one life, one power, one presence, one love. And that this love is all that matters. That we each become that divine channel for that love. It matters not who you loved, it matters that you loved. And loved with all of your heart. And this is what I know. That as each of us step into the awareness of who we are, that as we recognize that we are beloved expressions of the divine, that we are that expression of love manifest in the material world, amazing things happen. Miracles happen because that's what love is. Love is a miracle and love creates miracles and it creates big miracles and little miracles and all the miracles start with love. And that is what we are called to do. To express love. And sometimes love looks like resources. And sometimes love looks like a hug. And sometimes love looks like a rainbow. And all the time, love looks like you. And I know this love with all of the gratitude in my being. I am grateful to the power that is love. And I am grateful for the teaching that teaches me about that kind of love, about the divine love and what it's capable of and what I am capable of with it and what you are capable of with divine love. So I am grateful for this teaching. I am grateful for this community. I am grateful for our practitioners, our ministers, our musicians. I am grateful for each and every one of you. I am grateful for the technology that lets us send this out into the ethers and to have members all around the country, even around the world. And I am grateful just because it feels good. Try it. You'll like it. And I release my word into the law with love, knowing that it is done. And so it is. Say with me now, something wonderful is happening through me. Something wonderful is happening through me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in my mind. I feel it in everything I am. I feel it in everything I am. I choose it. I choose it. I trust it. I trust it. I use it. I use it. And I love it. And I love it. So it is. And so it is.